chapter 2 and verse 18 and also verse 21. Before we get into that, I'd like to point out to you that I have in my hand a hand calculator. And I am multiplying 7 times 24 and I get 168. Now, if I work that calculation on the hand calculator or if I work it by hand with a pen on paper, then the answer is still going to come up to be 168. Now, suppose you're not good at math, then you would have to take my word for it that 7 times 24 is equal to 168. If you are dependent on my person for the reception of that knowledge, if you have to depend on me for feeding you that knowledge, then some of you may accept what I'm saying, that 7 times 24 is equal to 168, and some of you may choose to reject that knowledge. Now, there's nothing that I can do to persuade you that 7 times 24 is 168. I can just present it to you as a fact, and then the rest has to be up to you. Now, whether or not you accept that 7 times 24 is 168, whether or not you accept it, it does not change the truth of the matter, that 7 times 24 is equal to 168. It doesn't change the fact of the existence of that equation. The fact that you reject it does not mean anything to the reality of the equation because you can't change it by rejecting the truth of it. Now, 7 represents the number of days in a week and 24 represents the number of hours in a day. There are 168 hours in the week. Now, if the good book says that 10% is not ours but the Lord's, then we owe the Lord 16.8 hours in the week before we begin to minister to the Lord. Before we begin any service, we have to sacrifice 16.8 hours. So four hours in church isn't not even a quarter of 16.8. Now I wonder what it would be like if God shared out his blessings according to our standard of sharing with him. Suppose he were to dribble down his wealth, which we have defined to you, as the experience of the original spiritual creation, where would we be left? The question is this, that we can only get out of God as much as we offer him of ourselves. Don't fool yourself. It can happen by no other means. He's not going to force you to go along with him. You have 16.8 hours a week that are the Lord's before you begin to offer himself of yourself. What, what is your response to this? What do you think of this? When you recognize that we are offering the Lord four measly hours in church every week, and sometimes it's not even that four hours. What does that say about the state of our relationship with God? Like, where does it leave you? We are up in the teens yet. We haven't passed 10. And if we are to have a relationship with God, I guarantee you that you're going to have to spend more than 17 hours a week in seeking God. I wonder if you're with me. Now, I want to make something very plain. I want to indicate to you, without being offensive, that you are not where God desires for you to be. It cannot be any plainer than that. I am not trying to offend you. I am indicating to you the way I see it in Christ Jesus. Now, if you are not guilty, just disregard what I am saying. But if you are guilty, then you must 
make a decision as to have some sort of change in your own life to bring about some semblance of interaction with God. Because the knowledge that I'm giving to you is not going to make any difference in your life. The knowledge I'm sharing you is not going to deliver you from the oppression that is hounding you. I wonder if you're there with me. It's very plain. I want to make something else very clear. And I want to speak it in words that are as plain as possible for all those who hear my voice to understand my intention in this life. All the false teachers in the world are screaming their false teaching from the highest people, from the biggest broadcasting system that is available. With that in mind, what should our approach be to spreading the gospel? Should we be apologetic for the knowledge that we have received in Jesus Christ? Should we, in, should we be embarrassed by all this knowledge that Jesus Christ has shown us? Should we be cowering down to bring it over to the church? Should I be... Let me... Just bear with me in my repetition. Should I be apologetic if you all don't mind I have to present this gospel to you all what should my approach be to the church because I'm merely at a loss to understand what is it that is required of me that will be pleasing to the church are you hearing me what is it that is required of me other than to bring to you what Christ has declared to me that is my function. Outside of that, I have no function. That is what God has called me to do. And you can bet your do bottom dollar that I am not going to shirk away. I am not going to evade Christ in delivering to you for those who want it. The reality of what exists in Jesus Christ for your own edification and for your own deliverance from the forces of oppression that harass you in your own life. I'm not going to be apologetic. I'm not going to apologize for preaching for two hours or for one and a half hours. I'm not going to ask you all to please to bear with me because, you know, I have something to tell you that God has given me to say to you. I'm not going to Please, you all, if you all don't mind, God has told me something to tell you. If God sent me with authority, I am not going to act in contravention to that authority. I cannot humble myself in a way that God does not require me to humble myself. I won't. I won't cower down to people's opinion of me or to people's attitude towards the church. I'm not going to cower down. I'm not boasting of myself. I'm boasting of Jesus Christ and of the fact of the reality. Imagine if no one will stand up for Jesus Christ. There isn't there no one in the world who wants to get up and say, Thus said the Lord. Is there no one in the entire world who will get up and say, This is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is there no one who will not be embarrassed and ashamed to say, this is the New Testament? Imagine, in all the world, there is no one expounding on what the New Testament is. Should our approach to Jesus Christ and this teaching that he has given us been one of embarrassment and apology? Can't, it can't be. It cannot be that this doctrine that Jesus Christ has given to us to tell people that they are called to a relationship with Christ and God, it cannot be that we hide that. It cannot be that we are ashamed of that fact. How can it be? How can it be that we who know God are ashamed to tell everyone 
that Jesus Christ is the living God, He is the risen Lord, and you can know Him. How can I hide it? How can I be ashamed of that fact? It's impossible, I won't do it. I will never hide my Lord. I will never be ashamed of the glory of God. Because that is what it is to be embarrassed about Jesus Christ. To be ashamed of His perfection and putting that perfection and excellence below the physical nature of man. Imagine me, who has experienced that perfection and glory and excellence. Imagine me hiding it and make it appear as if it is less than the physical glory that is in the church today. Imagine me hiding it. If no one wants to go, then we ought to be the ones to say, let us go. We will go, Lord. Send us. Because we are willing to go. Because we know that your existence and what you offer us in yourself is a higher level of existence in total fulfillment than what we have access to in this physical realm. We can't deny that fact. The same way that we cannot deny that there are 168 hours in the week. Do you want to know how many hours there are in a month? Multiply 168 by 4.5 roughly. You got 756 hours in the month. How many hours do you spend with God? How do you expect to spend an eternity with Jesus Christ if out of the 756 hours in a month, you spend nothing with God. How can you ask God then to allow you to spend an eternity of time with Him when you have not devoted even 76 hours of that 756 hours to Him every month? Do you want to know how many hours there are in the year? Multiply by 12. You get 9,072 hours in the year. Now, if you cannot say to God that you have spent 907 or 908 hours in the year with Him, how can you expect? Imagine, a measly 900 hours in a year. How do you expect to spend a million years with Jesus Christ in eternity after you die? You are serious about spending an eternity a million hours with Christ and just beginning to count if you're not willing to spend 900 hours with God every year. What kind of hypocrisy is that? Why should we want to spend an eternity with God if we are not willing to spend a thousand hours with Him now? Per year, why? It's hypocrisy. Either we want God or we don't want Him. We have got to make up our minds. What is it that we want out of life? Do we want to spend our eternity with the oppressor Satan in a void? With no identity? Or do we want to spend it with Jesus Christ, with God in eternal bliss? Let's not be hypocritical about it, my brothers. If these things are passing you by, it is my duty to indicate them to you. So that you will recognize where you're going and where you're going to end. The purpose of this church is to indicate to you when you're wrong. You know. You're going to know when you're right. You're going to know by the assurance of Jesus Christ that you're right when you're right. But if you're wrong and your carnal mind tells you that you're right, you need someone to indicate to you that you're wrong. My primary intention is not to be offensive. I don't come here to abuse you and to offend you. That's not the purpose of my being here. I want to be very clear tonight. I don't come to abuse anybody. I come to lift up the name and the nature of Jesus Christ and to help you as you go along your way to find God. That is the purpose of the church. Not to teach you a physical teaching, but to teach you to have an interaction and relationship with Jesus Christ so that you can experience the Father, your deliverance, and true worship. I hope what I've just said, that's not 
lock you down. Like you lock up the cupboard to your heart and you throw the key. We have to remain active and alive in Jesus Christ if we really are serious about this Christian walk. If you don't mind, turn with me please to Colossians 2 and 18 and 2 and 21. That's 2 and 18 and 2 and 23. And I want you to notice and underline in your mind at least the two words where it says voluntary humility in Colossians 2.18 and will worship in Colossians 2.23. I want you then to turn with me please to Strong's 2309, the word that was translated as voluntary. 2309, where it says, fellow, to determine, choose, or prefer acquiescence by implication to wish, inclined to, or to be about to. Who sees all of that? It indicates a choice, voluntary, that you're willing it. The second part of that phrase in Colossians 2.18 is humility. 50.12, please. Humiliation of mind, modesty. Humility is a correct translation. So voluntary humility is acceptable and it's desirable at this point in time. Are you with me? To be in humility is to be in the quality of being humble. It is to be humble. And Paul is speaking in Colossians 2.18 of voluntary humility. It speaks of choosing, making a choice to be humble. Now if you look at it on the surface of, of, of what it represents, there's nothing wrong in choosing to be humble on the surface of it. But in the context of 2.18 where it says, let no man defraud you in voluntary humility or let no man beguile you of your reward. To beguile you is to beguile you of your reward is to defraud you, to steal from you something that you have. The correct translation is to defraud. Beguile you is their spin on verse 18. Let no man defraud you in voluntary humility and worshipping of angels. Now, if you look at it in the context of what is said in Colossians 2.18, obviously, it is not something that is desirable, according to Paul. It's not something that is desirable. Why is that? If you decide that you're going to be humble to God, then in itself, that is something good. But Paul adds, intruding or invading into those things which he had not seen, suggesting that whoever this person is, if it applies to you, then you can try and justify yourself. Invading into the eternal realm, so-called invading, because you can't invade, but it's suggesting that vainly being puffed up by his fleshly mind. What is this suggesting to you? It's suggesting that you can tell yourself that you are going to be humble in your carnal mind without the carnal mind having been expanded because of an experience with the eternal realm in Christ and coming out of that experience is the humility and 
This is not what is being said in verse 218. It's the exact opposite of that. Voluntary humility speaks of someone remaining in their carnal mind, pretending to have had an experience with the eternal realm, and based on that, taking on an attitude or an air of humility, when in truth and in fact there is no humility in their hearts towards God because they have not experienced God. For you to be truly humble or to be in humility towards God, you must have experienced God to the extent of your recognizing Him and the fact that He is of a greater quality and of a greater existence and of a greater being than we are. Outside of that experience, it is just voluntary humility that you make a choice, you determine in yourself that you will be carnally humble to God and to those around you and to have a general attitude of humility. What is wrong with this general attitude of humility it, it, is that it is the result of a decision made by you in a carnally unexpanded mind. A mind that was not convinced by anything in the eternal realm. Where it says intruding, invading into those things that he has not seen. He doesn't belong in the eternal realm, but pretends to have invaded this eternal realm that he supposes exists in his own mind. A mind and heart that was still restricted to the physical realm, but still decided on a desire to reflect an air of humility, an atmosphere that you are humble, and this without cause. To be humble is having or showing a consciousness of one's shortcomings. And we can only be truly humble if in fact we recognize God and recognize that He is a greater being than us. True humility comes out of an experience of true and sincere worship. True humility indicates that we have surrendered to Christ and God. True humility reflects that we have seen Christ and recognized God for who He is. And having recognized God, put God's desire for us over and before our carnal image of ourselves. I wonder if you're there. True humility is esteeming God's conception of us over and before in priority. Your image of yourself, valuing God's conception more than your carnal image of yourself. This only comes because we are persuaded to submit by what Christ shows us exists in the eternal realm as he presents us the spiritual work that he worked in the age of spiritual creation and as he presents to us who we were at the end of that process. Who is here? True humility is not an imagined submission, but is based on direct concrete submission to God because of an experience with Christ and God. It's, it's very simple. Any humility that is short of a true experience with God is voluntary humility. A humility that you have taken on in yourself by your own carnal mind and by your own wishes. True humility is based on an interaction with Christ and God. I wonder if you are still here with me. True humility comes out of an experience with God that convinces us that God's conception of us and who Christ created us to be before the physical creation that that is greater than our image of ourselves. The image that we have of ourselves based on the world's reaction to us. And we often are shaped 
by what people say to us even without us recognizing that fact. We ought only to be shaped by what Christ shows us that we are in Him. Does anybody agree with that? True humility, I'm telling you, is based on an interaction with Christ and God. I want you to stay with me. I'm going to go again over the process that it takes to deliver us from our physical condition starting with the declaration and ending in this act of sincere and genuine worship that Jesus called to worship the Father in spirit and in truth we must seek God sincerely and honestly. Now this indicates in itself that if we are really seeking God, we must be spending time while we seek Him. There has to be an effort on our part. There has to be some time that we spend in trying to reach the level of existence where Christ is. If we seek him sincerely and honestly, Jesus says that we will find him. And when we find him, he will declare to us in a declaration the spiritual works that exist on the other side that ended in our original spiritual creation that we must conform to. Once we find Christ and he shows us something of the eternal realm, it is our duty, it is the least that we can do after having received mercy from Christ and God that we submit to it. We are duty bound to submit to what Christ shows us. It is for your own good. No evil can come out of submitting to God. Does anybody else agree with that? Nothing evil can come out of God showing you who you are in himself. In submitting to Christ, in saying to ourselves, I need to follow God. In coming out of that, we shall be spiritually connected to the individual spiritual work of the age of spiritual creation by Christ Jesus. What does this mean? It means we're going to be spiritually connected to a single Rima work and who we are at the end of that spiritual creation process. We're going to be connected to the single spiritual work and to the original spiritual creation which is the end of the process of spiritual creation. Because we experience the original spiritual creation because in spiritual terms in essence this is all God wants to know because we have become even if it is temporarily the original spiritual creation this makes us acceptable to the Father why? because this is what he conceived of in the conceptual age when he thought us up this means that Christ has justified us. He has made us righteous in the eyes of the Father. He has made us pleasing and acceptable to the Father. Since we are acceptable to the Father and Christ knows when we are, He takes us to the Father. Remember, no one comes to the Father but by me, said Jesus. Since we are acceptable to the Father, Christ takes us by the Father. This experience is what consumes our physical condition. I want you to pay attention, please. The process of our physical condition being neutralized begins with the reception of the declaration and ends with the experience of the Father. I wonder if you're there. The process, it is a process. 
when our physical condition is neutralized, even if it is temporary, when our physical condition is rendered entirely idle and useless, it is a process that begins with seeing Christ in a declaration and it ends with the experience of the Father. Our physical condition is not neutralized until we are passed by the Father. Also, the process The process of recognition of the Father has to begin somewhere. It does, just does not happen. It begins with our recognition of Jesus Christ in the Declaration. And we recognize the Father as a result of our passing by the Father. The process of our recognizing God is the outcome of this interaction with God. If we didn't interact with God because we were the original spiritual creation, we would not come to the end of the process, which is to recognize the Father. When we are taken by the Father, our physical condition is neutralized. This means that we have experienced the reversal of nature. This means our existence has changed from the physical condition to the spiritual condition. Because our physical condition has been neutralized as a result of our passing by the Father, it is only at this point when our physical condition has been neutralized that we can in fact recognize God being in Christ Jesus. It is at this point that we experience the perfection and glory, the introduction into the presence of God, if you want to call it that. The entrance into the presence of God renders our physical condition neutralized. Coming out of that experience, we can recognize, because we are spiritually conscious now, we can recognize the Father and we can recognize who we are in Jesus Christ. It is only at this point that our mind can truly function and recognize things that are there because our nature has been changed. Before this demarcation, before this, this cutting off point of our nature being changed, there is no recognition of who we are and there is no recognition of the Father. At the point where we recognize the Father, we fall and worship at His feet. Remember, worship is an act of recognition. And if you do not recognize God, then you cannot worship Him. Recognition means that you recognize that He is of a greater being and existence than we are even in our limited, and especially in our limited spiritual quality. I want you to turn very quickly with me, if you would, to John chapter 4. And I think you all know these verses. I have just described to you a process that began with your input of seeking God and Christ and it ends with worship that is the desired and the required 
end that God seeks for us. He seeks that we worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is the only worship that is considered worship by God. Anything else, if you pass through any other process that is not this process that I have just described to you, then God does not consider it to be sincere and true worship. Are you there? It's very simple. Explain. If you do not recognize Christ Jesus in the declaration and recognize something that he's showing you, leading to the recognition of the Father, the full recognition of the Father, and an experience of who we are, not just the impartation of some knowledge of who we are in Jesus, but the verification and the confirmation and the increase of the knowledge that we get from the declaration, unless that happens, God does not consider it to be this interaction, this worship that He desires. Now, God doesn't need the worship. The worship is an act that liberates us, and that is what God seeks for us. Whereas the church believes that God desires. I want you to look at the verses, please, in John 4. The Father seeketh such to worship Him. It's not that He needs this worship. The worship is for our own benefit. And we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Why does He seek it? Us to worship Him. For His benefit or for our benefit? God doesn't need anything. We need this liberation that the experience of worship offers to us. This and only this is the worship that God requires for our benefit, not for His. He desires and requires no other type of worship. He does not require voluntary humility. That is the exact opposite of what God requires for someone to make up in their mind, well, since God is God, then He must be greater than me. It's not about carnal knowledge. It's about an interaction and an experience with God whereby we see and we recognize that God's nature is immensely higher than our own. Who is still here? Why does Jesus say, worship God in spirit and in truth? In spirit, because we are in the spiritual condition. Remember I said that our nature has been reversed, that we have moved from the physical condition to the spiritual condition. Well, if you're not in the spiritual condition, you're not worshipping God in spirit because you're not in the spiritual condition. Isn't that plain? If we're not in the spiritual condition, we cannot worship God in spirit. If we do not experience God, we cannot truly worship God. It has to be an experience of God. We have to pass by the Father in Jesus Christ. If we do not recognize God, we cannot fall at His feet and worship Him, recognizing Him for who He is as a greater being because we experience our limited spiritual quality in comparison to the unlimited spiritual quality of God. When Jesus says in John 4 that we must worship the Father in spirit and in truth, the truth reflects that this worship must be this interaction, are you with me? This act of worship, this interaction, this recognition 
must be in the eternal realm where he is. You can't stay in the physical realm and say that you have worshipped God. It is will worship and it is voluntary humility. You will this worship on. It's based on your carnal mind, not on a concrete experience with God. I wonder if you're still there. Jesus says that we must worship God in spirit and in truth, indicating the truth indicates that we must be where God is if we are to say that we are in fact worshipping Him in truth. Now how can we get there? I've already described it to you. I've described the entire process. When we seek God, sincerely and truly means that we have sacrificed our carnal loss in favor of finding God. The Holy Ghost knows when this happens so that He can translate us to receive the declaration from Christ Jesus where He exists in the eternal realm. It is Jesus who then takes us by the Father once we submit to once to what He shows us. We must be where God is to be able to worship in truth. Otherwise, it is a ceremonial worship. It is adoration that, that does not reflect the true experience. It's very simple, isn't it? This entire process, stay with me because we're going to get into some definitions and you need to be acutely awake and aware of what I'm saying. And I'm not teaching you something that is of no significance. I'm teaching you basic doctrine that is Christianity. These are the basic elements of what Christianity revolves around. This entire process from the declaration to worship and everything that happens in between is the system provided by God to deliver us in this life and it is called the New Testament or New Dispensation. It is the dispensation that makes us new qualitatively. You there? Grace, grace is the influence of God and Christ that delivers us from our physical condition. Grace underlines and stresses the influence of God in this system called the New Testament or the New Dispensation. You there? Grace fixes our attention on the fact that it is God's influence that changes us. Grace fixes our attention on the influence of God on us while he abides there and we abide here in this system that God designed before the material creation that is called by God the new dispensation. Grace refers to the influence of God and Christ on us as he abides in the eternal realm to the full extent of our nature changing from the physical condition to the spiritual condition by the experience of the original spiritual creation because of the Logos, the spiritual connection by Christ. I'd like to repeat myself. Grace stresses or underlines or highlights God's divine influence on us that changes our nature according to the process that I have just outlined to you. The New Testament, on the other hand, 
is the entire process that begins in the age of the prototype through to the process of our spiritual creation and to our spiritual connection as we abide in this physical realm. And this process delivers us the entire process from the declaration to worship is the system called the New Testament by God. I wonder if you are there. The New Testament is the entire process provided and prepared by God before the material creation that would guarantee our deliverance from the physical condition to the spiritual condition until our final salvation because of our spiritual connection to the original spiritual creation by Christ. The New Testament refers to the system provided whereby we can experience the original spiritual creation of the eternal realm and that this is how God distributes his blessings which makes us of a new quality. The New Testament refers to the system or arrangement by which God's blessings are dispensed or administered to men as we exist in the physical realm. Thank you. True humility is to be humble to God, to be lower than God, to be in a place where we truly experience that we are lower than God. Otherwise, it is just voluntary humility. If we do not experience that we are lower than God, we are not truly humble before God, that's all. That is what Paul is saying in Colossians 2.18 and 2.23. Maybe you need to go back there for a second look. For us to be truly humble, we must recognize that God is a higher being than ourselves. And it is not about your carnal mind telling you that God is greater than you are. We all know that God is God. We are called to know this because we have experienced it. You must experience the spiritual con condition and experience that in our spiritual condition, God is greater than we are. Otherwise, it is just voluntary humility. Who is here? You've got to know this for a fact. You have got to experience that God is greater than you are if you are to be considered by God as humble. We know everybody goes around telling everyone else, you must humble yourself. And God will lift you up. Well, we now know exactly what humility we must be into that is different from the humility that is offered to us by the world. We have to recognize that God is a greater being than we are because we recognize God by Christ for it to be considered not voluntary humility. Voluntary humility is that you will the humility on yourself without any reason to be humble, without a knowledge of God necessary to make it true humility. In other words, you're just playing humble, you're playing games. In other words, you're just plain hypocritical, a hypocrite according to Jesus Christ, pretending to be something that you're not, vainly puffed up, showing an air of humility is to be vainly puffed up according to Paul in your carnal mind. Look at the word 3563, it's, it's noosey. It's over and above mind because it speaks of will. 
and that will represent something over and beyond the mind which is the heart or the soul inflated by your own mind and heart being deceived into believing you're right in right standing which is a false sense of security that comes from ignorance your carnal mind tells you that you're right when you're not your carnal mind makes you believe that you're righteous even when you're not that's the explanation for all the religious people believing that they are righteous when in fact they are not because we want to hold on to anything that says to us that we are right with God as a matter of fact that we are right above all other people there are no errors in me only in my brothers what I'm saying to you takes on a whole new credibility when you consider the next verse verse 19 not holding the head Khrateo to seize or retain establishes the fact of contact and personal interaction with God if you are in voluntary humility you're not holding on to the head you don't have this experience with Christ and God who's still here Colossians 2.23 speaks of this will worship willing that you worship remember we said that worship is involuntary we don't determine when we are to worship why? because Christ initiates everything in the process he initiates the timing and the fact of the declaration we have nothing to do with that we cannot decide when we are going to worship because Christ is the one who initiates the entire process that ends with worship who is here we don't decide well we are going to church to worship God we don't decide that we are going to shut ourselves up in our room and worship God God first has to declare to us and we have to respond to that declaration if there is to be true worship according to God's teaching will worship is false worship who knows that it is of the type of worship described by Jesus as being Sibomahi in Matthew 15 9 would you turn there please but in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men Christ has to teach us how to worship he has to make us able to worship I can't teach you worship by teaching you a physical teaching Christ has to exchange your nature for the spiritual condition if you are to truly worship God true worship is worship that is taught by Christ if you don't respond to what Jesus Christ shows you if you expect that you are going to obey the physical teaching that I am saying then all that you are going to end up with is what Jesus says is vain worship I wonder if you see it there look at verse 8 in Matthew 15 this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips but their heart is far from me what is Jesus really saying is he just saying that because he can speak or does it have some meaning some significance this fact of this people drawing nigh unto me with their mouth what he's saying is that they only are drawing close to where I am in the eternal realm with their mouth because in fact they're not drawing close to me in reality they are not close to me they are not in the eternal realm to worship me they are only speaking of this worship and they are in fact not here with me
God wants us to be with Him when we worship Him in spirit and in truth. To worship in truth is to, in fact, be in the eternal realm where the Father is if we say that we are worshipping Him in truth. We have to be there. Otherwise, we are not worshipping Him in truth. We are vainly worshipping Him. We cannot worship God if we are not translated to the eternal realm. Christ has to take us to the Father after the Holy Ghost takes us to Christ. Christ Jesus makes it clear in Matthew 15.8 that we cannot stay here and worship Him. Who sees that? Does anyone here see that? From the verses in Matthew 15. Our physical works that are determined by our inflated mind and heart do not give us access to God. You're trying to obey physical teachings that you hear from me or in the Bible are not going to give you access to God. It is only your reaction to Jesus Christ when He reveals the declaration to you that is going to give you access to the Father. Who sees that? Matthew 15, 9 makes it explicitly clear. If we teach men to obey the physical commandments, Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. What are the commandments of men? The teachings that we usher, including the teachings of Moses, including the teachings of Paul, including the physical words of Jesus Christ of Nazareth when he lived in, on this earth. If we teach that you have to love your neighbor, if we teach rules and regulations that have to do with the carnal understanding of the mind responding to a physical teaching, you're going to worship in vain. Why? Because physical words and your response to them does not give you access to God. What is it that gives you access to God is your positive response when Jesus Christ declares to you, it is the teaching that Jesus brings directly to you and your positive response to it that will give you access to the Father. Isn't that so? If for no other reason than for the one that I gave you in the process that ends with worship, it is because we submit to what Jesus Christ shows us that we can have access to the Father. Do you remember? Jesus makes it extremely clear. If we teach men to obey the physical commandments, then they are excluded from ever becoming close to Christ and God. They will never truly know what it is to worship God. Why? Because they have excluded themselves from the realm which will give them access to God, which is the eternal realm. It's not in the physical realm that we can find our deliverance. What I'm teaching you is to see Christ and when you find Him to submit to what He shows you so that your nature will be neutralized by an encounter with the Father. In other words, you'll be taken by the Father and your nature will be reversed so that you can recognize the Father and fall at His feet in worship. So what am I trying to teach you? I'm trying to teach you Christ, just like Paul says. It is Christ that we preach and nothing more. I am preaching to you the person of Jesus Christ and your submission to Him so that you can have the experience of genuine, sincere, real and tangible worship that is going to make a difference in your own life. I'm not teaching you an academic teaching. It's very clear. Jesus